Okay, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 20, please. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. And I'll be reading from verse 30, Acts 20, beginning in verse 30, says, And from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver, or gold, or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything, I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Of course, this is Paul here talking to the elders at Ephesus, his farewell address to them. Paul quotes a saying of Jesus not recorded in the gospel, something very rare. It's like one of the Beatitudes in that it presents us with a basic truth that reveals the inner workings of the spiritual kingdom but contradicts human nature. You know the idea that it is more blessed to give than to receive? You know, when Jesus says, happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, when he says that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, he's revealing a thing that may be true in the kingdom, but not necessarily true here on earth, in the world. Persecution, for example, is not a happy thing. It doesn't feel good, it doesn't bring any joy, especially when a person does what is right and is persecuted for it anyways. There's not a lot of joy in that. But in the inward spiritual person, there is joy because the persecution confirms and testifies to one's effort at doing what is right and it is an outward sign of one's faith and loyalty to Christ, which Jesus promises will bring a reward. So there is where the joy is for the spiritual man. And so the idea that giving being more a blessing than receiving is a similar teaching. It's true in the kingdom, but not necessarily true in the world. I mean, think about it now. Think about it. What's more fun, giving or receiving? Come on, tell the truth. What would you rather do? Give your money away or get a check in the mail from an unexpected tax refund? You know? Okay, let's try another one. What would you rather do? Give up your Saturday to drive your wife's aunt around who's in from Chicago? Or have your buddy come over to help you build a deck in your backyard and a new barbecue pit? Come on, tell the truth. Okay, what would you rather do? Organize a party to honor your supervisor's promotion to vice president? Or receive a letter of congratulations and a bonus as an encouragement for your hard work. Which would you rather do? So when we look at it from a human point of view, it is more fun, it is more pleasurable, it is easier and satisfying and desirable to receive rather than to give. You know, everybody says, oh, don't buy me anything for Christmas. Oh, no, you don't have to buy me anything. But they don't mean it. They don't mean it. Nobody likes to give out presents and stuff like that and, and have nothing come back at all. It's human nature. If this is so, why does Jesus say that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Well, it would seem that it is more blessed to receive than to give because people spend a lot more energy trying to experience the pleasure of getting rather than the blessedness of giving. And so the key word here in this verse is not the word giving, it's the word more. Jesus is not saying that there are no pleasures and there's no joy involved with receiving. 
He simply says that there are more intense joys attached to the act of giving. And so this evening I'd like to share with you four particular joys attached to the act of giving. Joy number one. Joy number one is the, the joy of acting as a spiritual being. That's one of the joys attached to giving. Giving is part of God's essential nature. He created the world and gave man life and gave man the garden and gave man a wife. He began by giving, Genesis 2 and 3. He gave His only Son, Jesus Christ, to save man from sin, John 3, 16. He gave man the Holy Spirit to empower His resurrection from the dead and to enable Him to live as a spiritual person, Romans 8, 11. God gives man the right hand of his throne along with Jesus to rule forever with him in heaven, 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. He gives, he gives, he gives, he gives. So when we give, we experience the pleasure that comes from acting out of our higher nature. The impulse to give comes from the spiritual man, not the fleshly man. The reluctance to give, the slowness to give, the resistance to give, um, and the resistance to give much comes from the flesh, and these are always at war with one another. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul uh, explains this phenomenon. He says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Yeah, the spiritual man wants to give, but the physical man says, not that much. <laughs> not that much. But when we give, one of the pleasures we actually feel, call it peace, call it satisfaction, one of the things we actually feel is the feeling produced by the victory that the Spirit has won over the flesh. When we give, we have acted as spiritual people and that actually feels good. That actually is a blessing. The second joy of giving is the joy of honoring God. Throughout the Bible we notice that every person who knew God or was aware of His presence had a need to formally honor Him in some way. God provided mankind with a, a formal way of doing this, the, the giving or the offering of a sacrifice. Because this is man's impulse to give to God when he knows God. Noah sacrificed to the Lord in Genesis 8 and Abraham gave sacrifice in Genesis 12 and Moses knew God and, and instructed the people in offering sacrifice in Exodus and Leviticus. Judges, David and those who returned from the exile all gave sacrifices to God in order to honor Him for various reasons. Now the physical method of honoring God has changed. We no longer offer produce or animal sacrifices, but the essence of that method remains, and that is the exercise of giving. You know, David said that God was not interested in the blood of animals, but rather in the condition of the hearts of those who offered them. If we read in, uh, in Hebrews, uh, excuse me, he said this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, 8, refers to this. You know, a sacrifice was acceptable because it was a given thing. Those animals and that food represented wealth to those who offered them. 
They were expected to give their best animal, their best produce, their best oil, their best grain to God in sacrifice. And this was not done without personal cost. It cost you something to give the best of your cattle, the best of your sheep, the best of your produce. There was actual cost involved. Those who gave in an indiscriminate way without reference to God still experience the pleasure of giving caused by the victory of the spiritual man over the natural man. You know, whether they believe or act out of faith or not doesn't negate the good feeling that results. In other words, even atheists feel good when they give. But the spiritual man who gives even a cup of water because of faith in God and Christ has the additional joy of knowing that he has also honored God and Christ through his giving, whether it's informally giving, you know, charity, or formal giving, the offering to the Lord. Another joy of giving, aside from the joy of knowing that we are honoring God as people of faith, that is the joy of anticipated blessings. Do you believe the Bible? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask you to say amen after certain, you know, certain things that I say here. Uh, so don't let it rile you up too much. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So do you believe the Bible? If you do, say amen. Uh, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Amen if you believe that. Amen. It also says those who believe and are baptized will be saved, Mark 16.16. 16, 16. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. It also says he who, uh, he who is generous will be blessed, Proverbs 22 verse 9. Amen. amen. Hmm. He who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Amen. amen. You know, many times we're willing to believe in God's power to create the world and God's power to create the Jewish nation. We believe and say amen to the, the teaching that God became a human being and died on a cross and was resurrected. We believe that and we amen with joy the fact that the Bible says uh, that God will forgive all of our sins we amen with tremendous joy when the Bible says we will have eternal life. Why shouldn't it be so difficult to understand and believe in amen that God will bless those who give and who give generously? If I can easily believe that when God said let there be light, there was light and I believe it, why should I have any problem believing and acting out the truth that God will bless us if we give and bless us generously if we give generously? You see, one of the joys of giving, especially for Christians, is that giving is the seed for getting. The more you give, finish it. The more you give, the more you get. The safeguard in this, however, is that if you give in order to get, you don't get anything back because that's no longer giving. That's trading, that's bargaining, that's bartering. But if your giving is really giving, in other words, letting go without demanding or grudging a return, then you will be blessed. How do I know this? The Bible teaches that. And Paul explains the blessing that you receive in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 and 11. He says the following. <clears throat> now he who supplies seed, so God is the one that supplies the seed, right? He says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So what God gives to the giver is an abundance of resources so he or she can continue to give and enjoy the experience as well as multiply the honor giving to God through the giving. I mean, that's a long sentence. I don't even think I could parse that sentence. <laughs> the point that he's making here is 
do not be afraid of giving. God can always outgive you. You can never outgive God. And the joy that the generous giver has is that God provides for that individual not only for his needs, but also provides enough for him to be a generous and even more generous giver. What a, what a, wonderful, what a wonderful promise. When you give, you are setting in motion a chain reaction that sees God increasing your stewardship of resources for the distribution of blessings to other people for His honor. This is an exciting and joyful prospect for those who start this cycle. Marty mentioned this morning in Haiti, what a great presentation, we were watching that from home. Um, and he talked about the uh, building in Cité Soleil and he was kind enough to, to mention I had some participation in that. But I was only one of many, many people who participated. I made the video of Haiti and presented it to people here in Oklahoma City. And back in the 90s, we raised over $150,000 to build that building. And at the time, it was the largest church building in all of Haiti, of any church. The important thing is, the people who gave the money for that building share in the reward of decades and decades of souls being saved, preachers being trained, children being taught, God being glorified. It's like you know, buying Microsoft shares back in the 60s you know, or, or Apple shares back in the 70s or something like that. They were in on the ground floor of a marvelous ministry. And many of those people have gone on, a lot of them even forgot you know, the money that they gave, but the people in Haiti haven't forgotten. And the honor accrued to those people because of the good works that continue to multiply cannot even be counted to this day. And so the fourth joy of giving is the joy of fellowship. Giving is something that brings people together in a good and a loving way. In Acts chapter two, verse 47, it says the following. It says, where am I? It says, um, uh, verse 44 rather, it says, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Here's the punchline. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Note that as the early disciples worked to meet each other's needs, they were automatically drawn closer together in joyful fellowship as well. You know, the, of course, the great need today, uh, Sunday, this particular day, is of course uh, Carl's family and you know, his children, their children, the, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, Robin, uh, of course, his daughter, and uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the Erskine family, and others, of course, they have a wide family. I mean, they have great needs today, and I heard as I came in, people were saying, well, we were over at their house, and we brought food, and you know, Tragedy brings people together, provides opportunities for giving. Uh, in our own little fiasco that was taking place at our house, I had people call me throughout the day and say, hey, are you okay? Can I come over and help you in some way? Do you need assistance of some kind? Several people called. Some, somebody called and said, do you need me to bring over fried chicken? I, I'm saying, no, but you can come on over anyways with the fried chicken. You know, it had nothing to do with the water, but. <laughs> Tragedies, difficulties bring people together. And the thing that cements them together is the fact that they have an opportunity to give something, whether it be an act of service 
or a word of encouragement or a hug. Notice that as the early disciples worked to meet each other's needs, as I mentioned, they were drawn together. They had the common effort at giving, mutual service, and they worked together in the service of others. These kinds of things bring out the best in us on behalf of other people. In addition to this, uh, the spiritual mindedness and the true honoring of God and the joyful anticipation of future blessings from God enriches our fellowship and makes it a joyful experience. I am persuaded that over at Joyce's house this afternoon there were tears, but I am persuaded there was also laughter. There was also moments of laughter thinking back about Carl and who he was and how he was, you, you can't help but smile. We publish the amount given each week. We used to do it here, but now we do it you know, in the bulletin for our collection. One reason to do so is to allow everybody the opportunity to see the common giving that we share in. If we gave X amount of money, you know what part of that that you participated in. This should be a way to make everybody feel the joy that comes with the common act of giving. So let me just summarize this, you can have the lesson. Giving gives us some things that receiving can't give us. Receiving with its excitement and thanksgiving and physical pleasure is at best a human thing. We're not ennobled, we're not lifted higher, we're not spiritually strengthened, when we're on the receiving end of things. God is the creator, Christ emptied himself, the Holy Spirit gives life and power, and we truly reflect the image of God when we give, not when we receive. Receiving does not honor God, it is an honor that we receive from others. Receiving draws our eyes upon ourselves and it has the inherent danger of greed and selfishness in order to continually repeat the pleasure. You know, I, like, I like getting stuff, maybe I can keep on. You know, little kids are like that. Christmas time, they got, you know, they've opened 40 toys and when it's all over, that's it. Right? They get a card, you know, just when they're old and they get a card, they rip open the card and they shake it, anything falls out of the card, oh, it's just a card. <laughs> Receiving does not beget more receiving. Only giving does that. Receiving's major blessing is that it prompts us to give thanks and hopefully seek ways to show our appreciation. If we respond properly when we receive, we will begin the cycle of giving, which will lead us to the joyful anticipation of greater things. And one other thing, receiving in the end is a lonely thing. Those who will receive our gifts will in the end be left alone with the gift and the momentary pleasure that it brings. We on the other hand not only have each other and a greater love for each other because of our giving, we also have the memory of this experience that will fill our hearts with joy long after we have done what we came to do. Jesus truly said it best, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I am blessed with growth. I am blessed with piety. I am blessed with abundance. I am blessed with love. Blessings that can only be obtained through giving. Blessings only given by God based on giving. So the money given today, whether you take communion and give your offering you know, tonight or you did that this morning, um, will be used uh, for church work, of course, and ministry. But the giving of it, however, is an offering to God to tell Him that we believe, that we love, that we obey, that we honor, that we are waiting for Him in anticipation of our final blessing. There's only one thing missing in this offering to make it perfect, and that's you. In Acts 4.32 it says, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They were united in Christ and united in purpose, united in fellowship. For the offering to be perfect, we need to be of one heart and one soul. God wants your heart and He wants your soul to be added 
to your church and to your check. If you're not a Christian, of course, God wants you to give your heart and soul to Him. That's what you need to give. He doesn't want your money. He wants your soul. He wants your obedience. And if you're not faithful, if you've been sinful, if you're, you've been separated from your family, your brethren, your friends, then God wants your heart and your soul back with Him and back with your brethren. Let's make today's offering perfect, shall we? Let's put all of our hearts and all of our souls before God today. And if you need to respond to Him in some way by giving yourself to Him, then we encourage you to come forward tonight as Bobby leads us in the song of encouragement.